about the choices we face and what we're calling a virtual town hall. Now, obviously, we can't get to all of you in a face-to-face meeting, so that's where new technology is coming in. We're reaching out to you via the phone. We see it as a massive town hall with thousands of people attending. And that's how we'd like you to see it. You're there with many other people who are also joining in. And you get the chance to put your questions to the Treasurer. And everybody else in the virtual town hall will hear the questions and will hear the answers from the Treasurer. Now, the important thing, if you have a question, there is a simple way to put it to the Treasurer. On your telephone, just press star 3. Press star 3 on your phone. That will take you to people who will take your details you'll go into a queue to talk to the Treasurer, the same as it works on Talkback Radio. We will then come to you and you'll get your opportunity to speak directly to the Treasurer. Obviously, you're not here to talk to me. It's the uh, my job to keep the, tre- the questions flowing for the Treasurer. You'll hear me occasionally introducing the next question. So remember, if you would like to put a question to the Treasurer, press star three. Hand over to the Treasurer now. Provide a brief overview on the state economy and the choices we face. Well, thank you very much, Tony. And again, can I thank everyone who's taken the time to uh, answer and phone in and uh, to listen to the discussion that we'll be having tonight around the Strong Choices Final Plan. Look, as everyone knows, um, the Queensland Government, state finances, face a few issues. And the biggest issue that we've had to deal with is this rapidly approaching $80 billion worth of debt. And what we need is a, a plan to deal with that $80 billion worth of debt, to reduce it to a level that we can afford uh, and we can reduce the interest payments. So we've we've released the Strong Choices Final Plan and it's a disciplined and methodical action plan to lower that $80 billion worth of debt and to reduce the amount of interest we pay. Now we're committed to delivering growth and providing the support required to uh, drive economic growth in Queensland and build a brighter future and provide jobs for Queenslanders. There's really no easy way to reduce the debt. As I'm sure anyone who's had to deal with that problem knows, you can only do it in a limited number of ways. You can massively increase your income, and in the state's case, that means massively increasing fees, taxes and charges. You can do it by reducing your expenditure, and in the state's case, that means by reducing services things such as hospitals and education and police and law and order, Uh, or you can consider uh, selling or leasing some uh, businesses or assets and using the proceeds to pay down debt. So there are no easy choices to reduce the debt. And what we found when we spoke to Queenslanders, and we had over 55,000 responses to uh, our Strong Choices budget tool, is that the majority of Queenslanders don't want to see increased taxes. They don't want to see a reduction in services and they are concerned about losing control uh, of the uh, assets. So as a result of that, and after listening to the feedback after we released our draft plan, the government has decided that the smartest and the strongest choice, uh, the one that secures Queensland future, that helps us pay down the debt, uh, helps us provide funds to invest in infrastructure and provide cost of living relief, uh, is leasing some assets. So leasing those assets means that Queenslanders will retain ownership and the government retains the power to determine and enforce the lease conditions. So under those leasing arrangements, the government expects to receive around about $37 billion. And from that $37 billion, we propose using uh, just under 75%, around $25 billion of the proceeds to reduce the debt to $55 billion. And all of our experts tell us that that's a level that Queensland's finances can sustain. It's a manageable level of debt uh, that means we're not spending every last cent on interest. Uh, We're also going to use $8.6 billion to establish a Strong Choices Future Fund. And that's 11 funds designed to build more schools, hospitals, roads and other vital infrastructure, as well as putting some money aside for a rainy day so that When the inevitable natural disaster hits, we don't know what it is, but we know in Queensland we're going to get one, we've got some money in the bank to be able to pay for the repairs uh, that are going to be needed to get the state back on its feet again. Uh, We also think that because of the leasing program, we'll get about an extra $3.4 billion, uh, and that's on top of what we thought we were going to get originally. And we're going to use that $3.4 billion to help Queenslanders deal with cost-of-living pressures. And so we've set up 
a cost of living fund that will be dedicated to providing electricity price relief. Importantly, um, we're going to be making sure that people who actually have uh, the solar feed-in tariff scheme that the previous government put in place will continue to be supported. They will receive their full entitlement all the way out to 2027-2028, but we are going to remove the cost of that from everyone's power bills, making, uh, on average, power bills $577 cheaper. Uh, so that will go to provide cost of living relief for families and for small businesses. Um, so that's what we're proposing to do with our funds if, after an election, the people of Queensland have endorsed that plan. We'll be taking that plan to the people of Queensland at an election uh, and explaining it and continuing to explain it to them. Uh, and if the people of Queensland support the government's plan to pay down debt, to provide funds to put into job-creating infrastructure and to provide cost of living relief of almost $3.4 billion, uh, we will put that plan into action and start delivering services, jobs and growth for Queensland. So that's the plan in a nutshell. And now over to you, if you've got questions, um, let's, have a, let's have a go at them and see if I can't answer them for you. Right, thanks, Treasurer. Remember, if you would like to put a question, star three on your telephone, star three on your telephone. First up, from Hendra, we have Sandra. Hello, Sandra. Hello, are you there? Are you there? Yes. Yes, is it Betty, is it? I have Betty? Yes. Uh, is it Sandra? Betty, it is. Now, oh, Betty, you're from Kalanga. The treasurer yes. is waiting for your question. Right. What would you like? Now, now I would like to know if we're going to lease the um, asset. For how long are we going to lease? It? Sure, Betty. Have you got a? Uh, what? Sure, Betty. Good? What? 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 Yep. Betty, what we're proposing to do uh, in terms of the lease is we're proposing to lease those um, assets for 50 years with a 49-year option, and that option uh, would come into play if uh, the lessee, the person running those business, meets all of their obligations. So it's a 50-year lease with a 49-year option. Okay, thanks very much, Betty. We now have Peter. Peter from Kedron. Peter, your uh, treasurer is waiting to talk to you. Yes, I. Yes, Peter. Yes, I'm currently involved in the expression of interest on a preferred dock application at North Shore Hamilton, and uh, looking at an, a non-conforming option, which actually we've labelled uh, innovative capital, uh, fiscal capitalisation. And rather than leasing, we are looking at proposing that the government actually gets, becomes an equity partner using the current asset, which the developer and or the people as a third party would become uh, involved in both equity and profit. And by doing so, you take a, what, what is normally called a fiscal loss asset, such as a park, etc., it actually becomes a fiscal asset, um, both benefiting the community, socially, and fiscally. Um, would like to sort of hear what your thoughts on this are and uh, how we might kind of go forward uh, in, in the direction of saying. Uh, well, Peter, um, uh, I, I'm always happy to talk to, uh, to you about uh, innovative ways to deliver services and to um, have economic activity and jobs growth here in Queensland and particularly down at Hamilton North Shore. As I'm sure you're aware, Peter, that's in my electorate. Um, but uh, uh, that's probably something, the model you're talking about there is something that we can uh, have a chat about uh, at my electorate office on a, on a Friday when I'm uh, in the electorate. Uh, I'm happy to um, get some details and arrange a meeting for you in the electorate office. But mm -hmm. as a general rule, uh, we tend to um, uh, look at uh, these sorts of areas uh, in terms of co-investment that you're talking in uh, and um, see what the benefit is for all Queensland out of doing that investment and getting it going. So that's really our guiding rule is what is in the best interest of Queenslanders out of any proposition that's put to us, whether it's a co-investment model that you're talking about uh, or indeed what we're talking about here, which is um, the long-term 50-year lease of these assets uh, to help us pay down debt. So that's our guiding principle. But if you contact 
uh, my office. Uh, I think um, someone will be able to take your details off the phone this evening and we'll make some arrangements to have a chat. If you'd like to put a question to the Treasurer, press star 3 on your phone, star 3 on your phone, and that'll put you in the queue to have a chat to the Treasurer. We have Colin from Deception Bay on the line now. Colin, over to you. Yeah, good day. How are you? Yeah, good, Hello. Colin. How are you? Yeah, good, mate. Um, I'm just wondering when they lease these things or sell them or whatever you decide to do in the end, uh, the prices of everything going to go up again? Like the electricity right, mate, and well, the water and... Sure. No, no, and that's a... That, Absolutely, that's a really, a really valid concern. Um, we have um, we have decided to lease them, so that's what we will be doing. It, it is a lease. That's the decision that we've made. Uh, in terms of the price uh, for that you pay for electricity, um, because uh, we know people are concerned about that, we've looked around and seen uh, what has happened in other parts of Australia where uh, private companies have got into uh, to running uh, some of these businesses and. Um, where we have had a look, and uh, a company called Ernst & Young have done some research on these sorts of things, uh, we've found that in Victoria and in South Australia, where the businesses have been run pretty much over the last decade by the private sector, uh, the network costs, so this is the Ergon, Energex and Powering costs, have actually come down by between 18 and 17%. So 18%, I think, in Victoria and 17% in South Australia. By contrast, here in Queensland and in New South Wales, those network prices have gone up in New South Wales by about 118% and in Queensland by about 140%. So ownership is not really going to determine the price. That's set by the Australian Energy Regulator and they set the price. And what they've said is that... Uh, for the next five years or so, the period for which they set the price, they expect the increases to be a lot less than they have been in the last 10 years. Um, so that's the story in relation to prices for the networks. Um, the other thing that we're doing, of course, to help Queenslanders with the price of electricity is we're going to remove the cost of the solar feed-in tariff. So people who currently receive the solar feed-in tariff, they will continue to get it, guaranteed, but everyone else won't have to pay for it through their power bills, which is the way the scheme was originally put in place. So we're actually supporting, if you like, uh, green energy by making sure that $3.4 billion is put aside to meet those obligations, but we're taking the obligation to pay that money away from everyone's power bills. And that'll save an average family, we think, about $577 over what their power bill would otherwise look like. Great, thanks very much. The next call is from Rachel. Rachel, it's uh, over to you. Hello, are you there, Rachel? Up here? Yes. Hello, hello, Rachel. I'm well, thank you. How are you? Hello, I'm very good. Um, now, so my concern is the taxpayers. Um, historically, we um, cover the cost of changes and decisions that are made by subsequent uh, governments that are voted in. And I feel very strongly that we have to get on top of this debt situation, whatever way that is achieved, and it will take a strong government to take us there. And you're making those changes, which is great. What mechanisms would you put in place to ensure that if a subsequent government is change occurs, that that decision can't be reversed and so all of our taxpayer funds go into the actual change of that decision without actually realising any benefit from it? Yeah. Rachel, um I think you've hit upon one of the big problems of democracies, um, and that is how does how does one government, which many people think is making the right decisions and fixing things up, make sure that another government doesn't do something silly and and, and make it much more expensive and and uh, horrible for taxpayers in the future? Um, in some places, they have uh, a requirement to have a balanced budget. For example, um, they they actually mandate that each year the budget must be balanced. And that sounds pretty good um, at, at a superficial level, but if you think about it, there might be occasions when you do need to borrow more and you do need to run a deficit. Um, we, might, uh, we, we would have some of those situations, for example, uh, if we were hit by another big cyclone or a big storm and in order to repair things, we needed to, for that year, borrow a bit more than uh, we were earning and uh, that would cost us and send us into the, into the red. Um, 
we have in Queensland a set of um, fiscal principles or requirements, and this government has said our aim is to have a fiscal balance by 2015-2016. That is, we don't actually have to go and borrow any more money. We've also had an aim um, that we would stabilise and then significantly reduce the debt. And we've actually put those aims into Parliament and we report on them every six months as part of our reporting process. Uh, but I guess ultimately, um, how do you keep governments from spending money that you would don't want them to or from making bad decisions that are ending, going to end up costing taxpayers more? Um, that's something that the voters have to decide every three years at an election. Um, and that's why um, our government has said we'll take our strong choices plan where we do make some strong decisions about paying down the debt and creating funds to invest in job-creating infrastructure to the people. And I guess the people will have the opportunity to compare our plan uh, with any alternatives that might be out there. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, our next caller is from Scott. And if you'd like to put a question to the Treasurer, star three on your phone. Press star three on your phone and you'll come through and get the opportunity to put a question to the Treasurer. Scott, it's over to you. OK, hello. Hello. Um, hello, Scott. My question, uh, my question is, um, in the event, uh, I'm, I'm 100% supportive of the, uh, of, of the leasing option. I think it's, uh, it's a smart way to go. But my concern is, um, if we have someone that takes on a lease and is not performing, um, and so there's two parts to that question. If they're not performing and what oversight is going to be put in place to um, that, um, that stipulates what, yep. you know, is considered to be sure. performance. And then if they're, they're um, deemed to be not performing, how, how can we ensure that the, the process of disengaging ourselves from that lease is um, the cost of that, which um, can, can be expensive, is not going to get passed on to the, to the taxpayer? Um, sure. That, that's my yeah. that's my concern. I just uh, I just I know especially with commercial leases uh, they're a fairly, fairly binding document um, on both parties and uh, so yeah that's that's my biggest concern. Yep, yeah, sure, mate. No, that's um, another another good question, Scott. And thanks for um, uh, your support of the program. Uh, a couple of things um, uh, in terms of the conditions, we will have some pretty strong conditions about what the, the owners must do. Uh, of those businesses when they operate them. Uh, and uh, obviously the first port of call is to make sure we're dealing with a reputable organisation when uh, those leases are offered up to them if, if people say to us at the next election that's what they want to do. So the first thing is, are we dealing with reputable people who have the capacity to be able to deliver the services? That's the first port of call. Uh, we're obviously not just going to deal with any Tom, Dick and Harry who walks off the street and says, I'd like to run these businesses. So we're going to do it in a very planned, careful and thorough fashion. Um, secondly, we've got the lease terms and conditions. And as you say, uh, there will be some very strict and binding lease terms and conditions to make sure uh, that um, the operators do do the right thing. On top of that, we've also got legislation in place, uh, such as workplace health and safety legislation, electricity security supply legislation, electricity safety standards legislation, um, a whole range of regulations and legislation in place that currently applies to those businesses which will continue to apply to them. Um, if they are not performing, then the government will have the right to step into the shoes of that non-performance and to make sure that it does happen. So effectively, if you like, if they have breached a critical condition of the lease um, about uh, which the government has said, if you breach this condition, we will terminate the lease. We will, the government will have the ability to step in and to resume operations of those businesses. We will have that capacity because physically those businesses will still be here in Queensland uh, and physically the government will continue to retain the underly underlying ownership. It will still be ours uh, at the end of the day. In terms of how do we oversight those businesses, which is the second part of it, um, the landlord, if you like, the lessor, uh, will be a government-owned company, something like uh, a Queensland Treasury Holdings Proprietary Limited. And it will own it and it will seek reports uh, from the landlord, uh, from the tenant, I should say, uh, and uh, it will also have capacity to investigate and inspect to make sure that the terms of the lease are being complied with. So this is a, a pretty well-established process 
Um, it's been done before. Uh, here in Queensland, it's been done uh, with things such as the Port of Brisbane, um, the uh, Brisbane Airport Corporation. In New South Wales, it's recently been done with uh, the Port of Botany and the Port of Newcastle, and as I say, in other parts of Australia. So it's a, a well-understood process. The key to it is, firstly, we make sure we get the right people who are the tenants. Secondly, we make sure we've got the right tough conditions in place. And thirdly, the government retains uh, final oversight through the lease and an ability uh, to take action should something go wrong. So I hope that gives you some reassurance about the plans that we're putting in place should our plan be supported at the next election. Great. Thanks, Scott. Uh, and if you'd like to put a question to the Treasurer, star three on your telephone, star three on your telephone, and uh, you'll come through and have the opportunity to put a question to the Treasurer. Joshua of Highvale has done just that. Joshua, over to you. Hello. Um, my question is that, so once these companies lease the assets, they'll own them for 50 years and they'll uh, do their best to keep to the conditions that you lay out for them and um, maintain a good service to maximise their profitability. But to keep their profitability at the as high as they can, won't they want to do a minimum amount of improvement that will affect the asset after the 50 years lease is over and they're not going to be seeing any benefit from um, improvement that they do to these assets? So my question is, what's going to keep these companies to keeping these assets at the level that we expect and to cope with um, growth in population? Sure, no, I understand what you mean. So, um, uh, how do how do we how do we make sure that they continue to invest and maintain these businesses for the term of the lease? Um, and um, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, we're offering these leases uh, on uh, fifty-year terms, as you say, uh, and uh, subject to the, uh, the the lessees complying with the terms of the lease, um, offering them then another forty-nine-year option. Um, from their perspective, from the company's perspective, it's in their best interest to make sure they're supplying as many customers as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Because as you rightly say, more customers means that they're earning more money. So what we want them to do is actually to be out there making sure that they are efficiently and effectively supplying customers with the electricity that those customers are going to need. Um, in terms of maintenance, the lease documents themselves will contain conditions requiring the lessees to maintain and upgrade the equipment. And that's a pretty standard commercial clause in, in these sorts of leases. So they can't just run them down and run them into the ground. Um, they have to maintain them. And if you think about it, um, if you're renting a house, if you're renting office premises, uh, even if you're renting a car, um, you're obliged to keep it in good shape and to keep it maintained. Uh, for these longer-term leases, um, where things run down, they'll be obliged to uh, renew them uh, and replace them so that they can guarantee a service. Uh, there's also legislation in place, yeah, around, particularly around the electricity businesses, which obliges them to um, maintain service um, throughout the state. So that if you're in rural or regional Queensland, there are uh, supply obligations to do that. And in southeast Queensland, on companies like Energy, for example, there are um, obligations on them to meet certain requirements, whether that's uh, repairs or restoring power after a storm event, and those sorts of obligations will continue to apply as they apply at the moment to the government-owned businesses. So we're confident that the lease terms will be able to ensure that the companies that do lease these businesses continue to invest in them, um, and it's also in those companies' own best commercial interest that they do that so that they can continue to reliably supply customers who will want to continue to be supplied by them and pay pay the bills that they will receive. Okay, thanks, Joshua. Our next call uh, is from John at the Gap. If you would like to put a call, put a question to the Treasurer, star three on your telephone, star three on your telephone, put you into the system, and you'll have the opportunity to ask a question of the Treasurer. John, over to you. Oh, okay. Uh, You're right, okay. John. Wonderful. Never, never called, called something like this before. Um, so pardon me if I stutter. Uh, no, go right, go right ahead and be nice and comfortable, John. It's no, no problem. I'm trying, mate. Um, the only concern I really have is what we're doing as the people of Queensland are providing all the capital money, all the capital and the infrastructure to actually um, 
supply the equipment for a business so that we can let somebody else take the profit from it. And this sort of bothers me. Um, It doesn't matter whether it's electricity or roads. Uh, If you look at, like, the Gateway Bridge, sorry, why is it better for a private enterprise to take lots and lots of profit from the from the tolls rather than say the main roads department running the toll area and the money going direct to the government sure um, well John um, to take to take your example in relation to the gateway bridge for example the gateway bridge uh, was funded uh, by the state government borrowing money and building that bridge and the state had to pay that debt back and uh, at the time that it was uh, built um, the tolls were actually used to pay back the debt on, on the bridge. Uh, and in fact, when the Gateway Bridge was recently sold, um, the debt, most of the money that the government received for that transaction, um, must be four or five years ago now, was actually used to pay off the debt on those bridges. So it was earning an income, but that income was paying the interest on that debt. And ultimately, when the Gateway was sold, the government um, received about $14 million dollars um, so that's not a very good return on some $2 billion worth of borrowings. Uh, and what we're saying with what we're doing, which is not a sale but a lease, is that uh, when we lease these businesses, uh, the price that we expect to get for that lease, instead of a yearly lease, we expect to get uh, a payment up front, if you like, pay the lease fee all in front. But also in that lease fee will be the expected profits for the next 30 years out of those businesses. So we'll receive those expected profits as part of the price uh, when we lease them, should the, should the people of Queensland support us. So we sort of bring to account now the um, profits that those businesses would be expected to be earned over the next 30 years, uh, and that's part of the lease price that we get for them. So we're not giving away those profits, we're just bringing them to account now. But what we are doing is we're swapping the uncertainty that they will continue to make profits, because not all of them do, um, for the certainty of a price right now. So we're exchanging uncertainty for certainty, and we're getting the profits that we think they might make over the next 30 years brought forward and paid as part of the lease payments. And importantly, we're also using that money to pay down debt, and that means the people of Queensland won't have to be paying $450,000 an hour in interest. We'll be paying a heck of a lot less, about... Uh, about $270,000 an hour in interest. So you can see a very big saving, about 40%, uh, on less debt. And that's why we think this is uh, the way to go forward. And that's why we think it's uh, uh, the smartest and strongest choice. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, over to Jared now. Remember, if you'd like to put a question to the Treasurer, star three. Star three, and that will put you into the system to talk to the Treasurer. Jared, over to you. Hello, Jared. Oh, good evening. I've got a couple of questions. One, say the normal working life of a power station is something like 50 to 60 years. Now, a lot of the power stations in Queensland are perhaps 30 years old. Is anybody going to take a 50-year lease on those power stations? And the second one, with the growing demand for electricity, sooner or later, additional power stations have to be built. Who will decide when they are to be built? And who will build them? Sure, Jared. Um, and um, what uh, what we believe, uh, and what uh, we're being uh, told by uh, our uh, expert advisors, is that there is certainly uh, strong interest in people uh, from people wanting to lease the power generators. Um, obviously, those people will make their own assessment about the value that they'll pay for those generators. Uh, our challenge as a government is to ensure that we uh, receive the maximum value for those generators for the balance of their um, of their lease term, and that's something that we'll be negotiating with um, with the potential people who want to lease those businesses from us. So uh, we're conscious of the issues that you've raised, uh, and our experts are telling us that there is um, a, a strong degree of interest in leasing those generators. So, um, but we won't do it unless it makes good sense, good commercial sense uh, and good practical sense. So our guiding principle is what's in the best interests of Queenslanders. Uh, and uh, I've said all along 
as part of this program that we're not going to be rushed, we're going to be very planned, we're going to be very methodical, and we're going to be very thorough about it. Uh, in terms of the demand for power, um, the demand for power in Queensland has been a bit flat for the last couple of years. Um, that's for a number of reasons. But uh, one of the big reasons has been that as people have put solar panels on their roof, uh, they haven't used as much electricity as they might otherwise have done so. Um, but in the next five years or so, um, the forecaster for electricity consumption, which is a national body, um, the national electricity uh, regulator is forecasting increased consumption, but we have plenty of excess capacity in the system as it currently stands. Um, it would take a, a very, very rapid increase uh, and a very sustained increase in power consumption for the current generating capacity not to be able to meet demand. In terms of any new capacity or generation capacity that might be required, um, well, that would always be a case of someone in the market seeing an opportunity for uh, further electricity generation. The Queensland Government hasn't invested in any new electricity generation capacity for probably over a decade now, and it's been the policy of both previous governments and this government is that any new electricity generation capacity would be provided by the private sector, and that's in fact um, been the case now. About 40% of the electricity in Queensland is already generated by the private sector uh, through more um, technologically advanced and newer um, power stations, including gas-fired power stations. So the private sector has seen an opportunity to generate power, uh, and in the last decade has actually been uh, the, 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 the provider of new power sources into Queensland, and I would expect that would continue. Great. Thanks, Jared. If you would like to put a call to the Treasurer, star three on your phone, Chris, star three on your phone. That will put you into the system, which will uh, hopefully allow you to put a question to the Treasurer. Now over to Charlie. You're on, Charlie. Oh, hello. Hello, Charlie. Hello. Yep. Um, yeah, nice to talk to you. Uh, my question is whether that, um, particularly power and water are pretty much a necessity of life. They're not really an option that you can just switch off on people. Um, so the question I've got is, when they are actually sold to... We're sort of continually told that it's going to produce competition, but they're actually sold as a private monopoly. So what I really would like to know is how do you tackle a monopoly becoming competitive? So that's the biggest issue that I see with selling off perhaps sure. uh, no. power. Sure, Charlie. Uh, look, um, uh, well, firstly, um, just to go back again, of course, um, we are leasing them, so we retain that underlying right of ownership over over the term of the lease, and I think that's important. Uh, we're certainly um, not saying that they will not continue to be a uh, the sole provider of power. Um, the competition has come from the retail end. So these days, instead of just having one uh, retailer that you can go to, in the old days it would have been Energex, you can now go to AGL or Origin um, or um, Energy Australia, uh, anyone, Click Energy, any one of a number of retailers who will offer you different deals. And for those people who want to have a look at it, you can go to the Queensland Competition Authority website and do a price comparison because they've got price comparisons online there. So the competition is in the retail sector where you can shop around for the best deal. Certainly in, term of, in terms of the networks, that's the poles and wires that carry the power, um, they will continue to be sole operators because no one could really expect uh, another company to come in and build all that, all that infrastructure again. Um, how, they are regulated by the Australian Energy Regulator. They're currently regulated by the Australian Energy Regulator and they will continue to be regulated by the Australian Energy Regulator. And they're a body um, based uh, in, uh, in Canberra, uh, and they review all of the actions of these companies to make sure that they don't engage in behaviour that gouges people, um, that their prices are reasonable, uh, and that they're not either over-investing or under-investing or overcharging or undercharging. And it's a bit of a, a black art as to how that's done, uh, but that is the way that all energy networks on the eastern coast of Australia are regulated. Uh, it's done by an independent energy regulator. It's not done by uh, either the Queensland government uh, or the companies themselves. So every five years they have to submit their plans to the regulator and the regulator says what is, what is and is not allowed or reasonable 
and how much can be charged for those services. And that's how um, control, if you like, is kept uh, over these monopoly providers. So I hope that gives you some um, answers to those sorts of things because we do recognise that those businesses are essential uh, and people don't have a choice. Um, and that's why these regulators are put in place to make sure um, that as best as possible, um, the prices are not um, monopolistic prices, that they are fair and reasonable prices. But that doesn't mean that they don't go up, as we all know. And um, they have gone up quite a lot in the last five years. Well, thanks for your time, Charlie. Over to Ken now. Ken, and if you'd like to uh, put a question to the Treasurer, star three, press star three on your phone and you'll come into our system. Ken, over to you. Ken. Hello, hello, Ken. Hello? Yeah, mate, go for it. Are you there, Ken? Do you have a question for the Treasurer? Hello? Are you there, Ken? Ken, do you have a question for the Treasurer? Yes. My one is not so much on what you're doing regarding the um, power situation and the leasing of Queensland assets and that. Mine is of accountability. And I get concerned with several of my friends who I speak to that the lack of accountability by governments, and I'm particularly thinking of the previous Labor regime from Mr. BT and Mrs. Bly, who managed to rack up $80 billion worth of debt on a population of approximately 5 million people with all the assets that this lovely state of Queensland had, you know, mining, agricultural, tourism and many other things, and they just simply slip away when they lose an election and there's no accountability whatsoever. And I think that's rather unjust because you cannot do that sort of thing in the private side of the world at all. And this happens even at federal level, as we see we're now going through a terrible time right now because of Mr Hockey having to impose quite a lot of restraints on many, many things, simply because of enormous debt that the federal government's got and the horrible debt that you've got that's costing us so much by the hour that that figure astounded me. So I'm just wondering, is there anything in the parliamentary system that can be fixed that stops this sort of thing going on? Ken, um, I can tell you that that is something that has been raised with me many, many, many times. And uh, as you say, uh, when you get governments that indulge in uh, spending sprees of other people's money that don't properly explain or account for it, uh, and um, the taxpayers got to fix it up at the end of the day, it's enormously frustrating. I just uh, I think uh, that um, the best response to that sort of issue is the power of the ballot box um, to uh, make sure that um, if you are unhappy with the decision of the government, if the way that they've behaved, uh, that you hold people to account through the ballot box. And I guess uh, we're saying the same thing from our side. We're saying uh, we have to fix up this problem of this $80 billion worth of debt. Uh, we have to have some funds to invest in infrastructure to create jobs. We have to do something about the cost of living, and this is our plan, and we're asking the people of Queensland at the ballot box at the next election to endorse that plan. And if they don't, uh, if they don't support this government, well, uh, then uh, the alternative plan would have to be considered, and, and, and people would have to look at what the alternative is being put forward. But it is very difficult in uh, politics where, as a matter of policy, governments make these decisions, uh, to be able to hold people, as you say, to more account than the account that the ballot box allows. Um, so um, I guess I would simply say that people ought to remember how people have behaved in the past because that is the best guide to how they will behave in the future. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks Ken. It's um, now your opportunity to put a question to the Treasurer. Press star three, star three, if you'd like to get into the system to put a question to the Treasurer. Now, I hope I get the pronunciation of this name correct. Is it Siobhan? Yes, it is. It's over to you, Siobhan. Hi, Kedra. Um, My question Hello, is... Hello, Siobhan. Hi. The government has had these assets for so long and, like, they should be able to control them and everything and they've got experts in there. So why are we giving it to a public company? Like, 
if they can make as much money as whatever it is, then why can't the government make that same amount of money? Uh, well, Siobhan, um, the government um, makes money out of some of these businesses and certainly uh, out of the electricity network businesses it does make money. Um, it makes some money out of the Port of Gladstone. It loses some money out of operating a coal-fired power generator. Um, and some years it makes money and some years it loses money in other businesses. What we're really saying is that the amount of money we make does not cover um, sufficiently uh, the interest that we have to pay from owning these businesses. And uh, what we need to do also uh, is pay down the total level of debt that we've got here in Queensland. So, uh, yes, uh, these businesses are being run by uh, teams and managers and, and people, and yes, they are making, uh, making money. Uh, the total amount of money they can make is limited because they're regulated, but our problem is that we have to pay down the debt so we don't continue to pay that $450,000 an hour in interest. And so, um, unfortunately, um, we're limit we've got limited choices. We either increase taxes, uh, we reduce services, or we consider the sale or lease of some assets. Uh, those are the only three uh, realistic options or some combination of them that is going to work. Um, I've travelled the state. I've done more than 27 meetings. I've spoken to many thousands of people and said, if someone's got a fourth answer that is realistic and works, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm eager to hear it. But I, I haven't yet, uh, and that's why we're considering and have decided that the um, strongest and smartest choice to pay down the debt to avoid that big interest bill is to lease these assets on long-term leases subject to strong conditions. Um, that's unfortunately the position we find ourselves in because of that $80 billion worth of debt. It's just too big to be paid off using the income of the state receives. Great. Thanks, Siobhan. Uh, if you'd like to put a question to the Treasurer, star three on your phone. Press star three on your phone. Robin's done exactly that, so it's over to you. Robin, are you there? Oh, yes. Um, we're currently receiving 44 cents um, kilowatt rebate uh, yes. because we install solar panels. Um, we're, we're not using as much electricity as our solar panels create. So uh, we, we do nice um, check every now and again in the mail. Uh, what happens when, for how long will that rebate continue and what happens when, or will the government remove that? Is, is it a given length of time that the rebate? Or is that uh, not well, indefinitely? So, Robin, um, firstly, uh, your 44 cents a kilowatt hour is guaranteed. So you have that uh, for, as long, for, as long as, for as long as you're in that house up until... 2027, 2028. So the 30th, uh, I think it's the 30th of June, 20, uh, 2028 is where it runs out because when you entered into that agreement um, a couple of years ago, uh, you would have entered into an agreement that says you will receive that 44 cents a kilowatt hour until 2027, 2028. So that contract you entered into uh, back then, probably uh, three or four years ago, um, will, will be absolutely honoured. And in fact... We will be securing for you the payment of your $0.44 cents a kilowatt hour because we're going to use $3.4 billion from the leasing of these businesses. We're going to put that aside and hold it in trust, if you like, um, to be able to make sure that you receive your payment um, until your contract ends or until you move out of that house. Right. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for that call. Uh, it's now over to Steve, Steve of Deception Bay. Uh, your chance to ask the question of the Treasurer. Hello, Steve. Yeah, hi, there, Steve? Steve. Yep. Yep, go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, this is Steve. Um, yes, Steve. How, how would we actually pay uh, and get um, infrastructure done? Because uh, some of these things, like the roads and, um, the, and the rail... Um, they've actually cut the staff uh, for, say, um, main roads, but um, we still have to uh, uh, repair 
uh, some of these roads, and uh, in, particularly in our area, um, the rail link uh, to uh, Kipper Ring was supposed to have been uh, completed uh, a few years ago. We're still waiting for it. Okay, Steve. Um, the just to just to uh, deal with that last bit first, the Morton Bay Rail Link, uh, which is the one I think you're talking about, um, that's a big project. That's currently being built right now, right now. Um, it um, uh, was um, uh, something that uh, was started. Uh, the process was started, I think, back in 2010, uh, and construction has commenced. The new stations are planned and ready to go. And I understand that project is well underway. So the Morton Bay Rail Link, um, Kipper Ring, uh, is well and truly underway. It's being built now. Um, and I suppose it's been about 100 years in the coming. So um, I'm not quite sure what the completion date is, but it'll be in the next couple of years that that will be finished, providing that service there. Uh, in terms of um, uh, dealing with roads, and I, I know up in, um, I think you're up in Deception Bay and that part of the world, I know um, there's quite a few road issues up there. and one of the benefits of this Strong Choices Plan is that we're creating some funds to enable us to invest in roads and also South East Queensland roads. Uh, $1.5 billion to invest uh, extra to invest in South East Queensland roads. So it's over and above what we already spend on roads. And uh, who builds those roads? Well, that can be either the Department of Transport and Main Roads people, but it doesn't have to be. Often it can be private contractors and governments already use private contractors throughout Australia, including here in Queensland, uh, to build these new roads to make sure that we're getting good value for money uh, and good services. So Deception Bay um, is being uh, going to be serviced by the Moreton Bay Rail Link, and in terms of roads, we're putting $1.5 billion aside uh, for additional funding on roads in southeast Queensland, uh, and in terms of how we deliver those, we'll be doing it using either people in the main roads department or private contractors, as we have always done. Brad, thanks very much for your call there, Steve. It's now over to Annette. Annette, your opportunity to speak to the Treasurer. Uh, Annette. Mr Nichols, how are you? Yes, I'm, I'm fine, Annette. How are you tonight? Oh, well, thanks. Can, do you really think that maybe 50 years could be a little bit long to start with? Or leasing? Well, and it, um, on these sorts of um, matters, I guess we've got to, um, I guess, strike a balance between uh, how long they are and the return that we get for Queenslanders from them. And our advice from the people who are uh, specialists in this area and experts in this area, including the independent Treasury officers, um, and the independent Queensland Treasury Corporation is that a 50-year lease um, is the best way to go. Um, there are lots of options. Um, some people uh, believe that you know the lease should be 200 years. Others think it should be 150. Um, but it's got to be long enough to make the investment worthwhile from a lessee so that we can get the return to pay down the debt. And we think a 50-year lease, subject to strong and uh, clear conditions, uh, together with the 49-year option, is the right balance. So after 50 years, if the lessee doesn't want to proceed, it comes back to the Government of Queensland. But if they have been delivering on the job that they said they would, that they promised under the contract, they're meeting all their requirements, uh, then it can be extended for another 49 years. But importantly, at the end of the lease, um, those businesses... The underlying ownership of those businesses comes back to the people of Queensland and through their, their government at that time, they can make a decision about how they want to deal with it next. So we think 50 years, together with the 49-year option, subject to strong conditions, is the best way to make sure we get the maximum value for Queenslanders, but also the best way to ensure that we can retain some underlying control uh, and um, we will get those assets back at the end of either that 50-year period or if the option is exercised at the end of the option. Great. Thanks for your call, Annette. It's now over to Rod. Rod, uh, your opportunity to talk to the Treasurer. Yes, good evening. Tim, how are you? I'm good, thanks, Rod. Hello. 
Uh, look, my, yep. my one main question is what other avenues are you going to be going down in order to be able to alleviate some of this debt? Um, obviously, it's going to be a very, very time-consuming uh, operation, but there's, surely there must be other avenues that are going to need to be to be chosen in order to be able to alleviate this massive debt that we're, uh, we're trying to, to pay. So, Rod, um, yeah, we're not just um, we're not just sitting on our hands, um, waiting waiting for for this to happen. Um, since we've come to government, we've done quite a few things. What we've done is we've uh, cut our own expenses. We've realised that uh, we have to also practice what we preach, and so things like uh, travel costs, things like advertising costs, things like consultancy costs, we have trimmed our sales on all of those matters. We've also gone back and looked at what we are spending money on. So when we came to government, the debt was forecast actually by the former government in their last budget documents. They forecast we'd actually be at $85 billion worth of debt right now. And we've taken uh, $5 billion of that debt away already by being smarter about where we spend our money um, and by not spending more than we're earning. And so now uh, we believe that we'll stop the debt at $80 billion. So that'll save $5 billion, uh, and that means that's interest we don't have to pay on that dead money. Um, we will do more by making sure that we don't make losses, which is what the previous, uh, which is what led to the increase of debt previously. That is, every year that you spend more than you earn, you've got to go out and borrow the money to make up the difference. And that has added to the debt. So we've stopped doing that as well, and next year, uh, we'll have what we call a fiscal surplus. That means we won't have to go to the bank to borrow any money in order to meet our obligations for the first time in a decade. So that's what we're doing in the meantime, and um, that's uh, that's been some pretty tough work. Um, people know some of the things that this government's had to do to do it, but we were determined to do it because we don't want to increase taxes, nor do we want to reduce services at the front line. We want to make sure that there's enough schools that people get seen in hospitals and that we have enough police on the beat. So we're not just waiting for uh, the uh, asset leasing program. We're actually getting on with the job ourselves and we're starting by looking close to home at about how we spend the money and making sure we don't spend more than we earn because it's gone on for too long and that's why we've got the problem we have at the moment. So hope that gives you some, um, some reassurance, Rod, that we're not just um, sitting here waiting for this to happen but we're actually doing some other things as well. Great, thanks, Rob. Uh, over to Robert now with a question uh, for the Treasurer. Yeah, uh, Robert from Everton Park here. Hi, um, my, my, yeah, what my question is, is how can leasing uh, pay down the debt if they're going to make a profit? If the electricity company's making profits, if we're going to lease it, they're going to want to make a profit on top of that lease. So how's that going to work? So, uh, well, what will happen, uh, Robert, is that uh, when we lease these businesses uh, to the people who want who want to invest in them and run those businesses, um, they will pay they will pay us the price for those that they um, think that think that they're worth. Uh, we can use that money, the price of that money, to reduce the debt that we hold. Now, yes, they're going to continue to make them run, and yes, they're going to continue to expect them to make a profit. Of course, that's the case. Um, you would expect that we would do that as owners of them ourselves. But what we will receive is a big capital payment, and we can take that capital payment and use it uh, straight away uh, to pay down the debt. So um, in that sense, uh, you can lease your house, um, and uh, if you lease it for 10 years and you say, well, pay me the 10-year leasing fee now, I can take that 10-year leasing fee and go out and pay down some of my mortgage. Um, and that's what we're proposing to do. Get that, get that upfront payment, take that money and use it to pay down the debt. Now, the person who leases the place can continue to use it for 10 years uh, and continue to occupy it uh, and maintain it and so on, uh, but we've paid down that debt and that's what we're dealing with right now, paying down that debt. So a capital payment upfront that we take and use to pay down the debt at the beginning of the term. That's how we're proposing to do it. OK, thanks, Robert. Thanks for your question. And now it's over to Malcolm. Malcolm uh, has a question for the Treasurer. Good evening, Treasurer. I really appreciate Hello, this opportunity. 
Goody, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak to you tonight. It's wonderful what you're doing. Uh, I agree with your leasing plan, but the leasing details would not be easy to write. You'll have difficulty sorting that one out. But I've also got two other major avenues to, to reduce your debt. One is the state government owns acres and acres of land next to every railway station, especially around the uh, metropolitan Brisbane. And I'd like to see that joint ventures with private enterprise or otherwise sell the land to private enterprise and get it moving quickly because there's millions of dollars that the state government can get in with that land that's sitting there doing nothing. And I have another avenue that you can <laughs> gain yep. revenue, and it's an ugly word, and it's called death duties. But, however... If death duties, state death duties were brought in and paid over a 10-year period, it would hurt nobody and the state government would get in millions. And if it was a death duty paid immediately would be an outcry. But if it was paid out over the following 10 years, it would hurt nobody. And I think the state government should consider it. It's a shame that the previous government left you in this mess. Well, well, thanks, Malcolm, and um, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. One of the great things about this program that I've been on, this Strong Choices program, is um, the great variety of Queenslanders I've spoken to and their passion for their state. Whether they agree with us or not, they've all been passionate about it, and you're obviously pretty passionate about it. Uh, in terms of the details of, uh, of the leases, um, yeah, well, we've got, um, we've got some specialists, including not a few lawyers who I'm sure we can work with to make sure that's right, but uh, the details will certainly be around making sure that we've got strong conditions that people do continue to run those businesses, they do continue to maintain them and keep them up to scratch. So that's that's what I will be instructing people to do. The land around the railway stations, um, look, we agree, uh, and we um, are in the process of making sure uh, that that land is used. In some cases, it can be sold for commercial development and uh, the money ploughed back into public transport services, uh, which is what we're doing. In a couple of cases... We've also made donations of land uh, to charities uh, or people like the Brisbane Housing Corporation so that they can provide affordable housing for people who can't otherwise afford to live perhaps close to the city where their jobs are. And in my part of the world, around Lutwich, um, around the new busway station there, there's a parcel of land that only two or three months ago um, we donated to the Brisbane Housing Company and the Multiple Sclerosis Society, if memory serves me correctly, um, in order to be able to provide accommodation for people uh, who need um, affordable accommodation and accessible accommodation. Um, in relation to um, death duties, well, you've really put two together there, death and taxes, the two things that are uh, yeah, obvious, uh, unavoidable for everyone. Um, Malcolm, look, up. I appreciate your suggestion, but I have to say um, that uh, at this stage in proceedings, we wouldn't be contemplating uh, those sorts of duties. Uh, I think... Um, at We've got enough to do on our plate at the moment with paying down the debt, uh, and uh, that's what we're doing at the moment. So um, it's an interesting suggestion, but it's not something that the government will be taking up just at this time. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks for your time this evening, Treasurer. It's been a great night, great questions. I'd like to thank you all for participating. Thousands of people on the line, and unfortunately we couldn't get to all your questions. If you would like to leave a message for the Treasurer, please stay on the line and you can put that question there in the voicemail. Thank you, Treasurer. Thanks, everyone, and thanks for everyone who uh, was on the line. Uh, and uh, please do leave, if you have your questions, leave your questions on the voicemail so that we can get back to you. Right. Thanks for being part of this virtual town hall this evening. Good night. Good night. The telephone has ended. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me about the government's plan for secure finances and a strong economy. If you didn't get a chance to ask your question, please record it after the tone. Please remember to state your name and provide an email address so we can respond to your question.